everyone. My name is Monica Pampel, and thank you for joining me today for Your Muscles Can Hear You, So Be Nice. Today, I'm going to share with you a slide deck that was not just created haphazardly. It is a total geek out on research and has some fantastic applications, as well as some real fitness hacks for your brain in order for you to control your muscles, both while you exercise and while you're just watching TV. So stick with me as I share my screen for the slide deck here. And we are going to enter in to a slideshow. Awesome. So here's my title and all the letters that come after it. Um, brief background on me. I got my undergrad um, at GW in psychology with a focus on neuropsychology. Uh, I was pre-medical background and a bio minor. Um, I also swam at GW back in the day. Um, so a lot of time to think alone, swimming back and forth in a pool of chemicals, uh, which is uh, part of the reason why I am who I am today. Um, all kidding aside, um, athletics and a focus on science sort of molded me into the person I am today, uh, vocationally and avocationally. So I'm really excited to just share a little bit of knowledge on a subject that I'm very passionate about and that I still use with clients today. I'd like you to view this one minute long uh, teaser, which you can share or view on my LinkedIn page after the presentation for those who might have missed it. So I'm going to unshare my screen here. And I'm going to reshare the teaser video. So I hope that's enough for you to stick around for the rest of the presentation. If you don't, then I have my two friends back here, these guys who will listen to me the entire time. Um, I'm going to reshare my screen now with the slideshow and move to the next slide. All right, so again, a little bit about me. Um, after undergrad, I uh, decided to ditch medical school. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, the MCAT was not one of them. It just, you know, after the MCAT, I just decided to, frankly, go another route. Um, the cynicism and the state of healthcare in this uh, country and around the world right now is very troubling to me. So I decided to place my efforts more on the preventive care side. Um, so what better place to start than becoming a personal trainer? I've been a trainer through NASM since 2007. I went back for a master's degree at GW in exercise, nutrition, and eating behavior. And I was training all throughout that time. After I got the master's degree, I started my own company called Pentafit. Uh, and it started to engage large organizations in corporate wellness programs and uh, just uh, still see individual clients because um, I will never stop training. I'm training this afternoon. Um, I, you know, I always train part time, even through my second master's program uh, in behavioral economics. Um, I realized once I just kept training and training and seeing clients and seeing large groups that 
our minds control so much more than our bodies do when it comes to exercise, when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to behavior and habits. Um, so that's become a primary focus for me throughout the years that I've been doing this. Um, so I'd like to just first share a little, you know, like shameless self-promotion. Um, that's a little bit of a ditty on who I am and how I train. Um, I believe that if you do a workout, if you do not think about it while you're doing it, then you do not receive the full benefit of the workout. Um, I have not quantified the benefit that you receive if you don't think about it, but I can safely say that uh, through experience training clients, I know that when they think about what they're doing while they're doing it and actually do less, they get more benefit out of the workout. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's let the geeking out begin. Okay, so just a note about this. Um, behavior and psychology are not the subject matter of this uh, particular presentation. This is much more on um, neurology and uh, neuromuscular connections and what happens in our brain when we think about our muscles, what's actually going on. And like the short video presented to you, um, with fMRI and EEG, even though this type of research has been going on since at least the 70s of applied sports psychology, we now know what's actually happening when people think about the muscles, when people watch other people exercising, um, the, the role of positive and negative self-talk, all of which we're going to discuss. And then you're going to learn how to use it with your clients if you happen to be a fitness professional or for yourself or your, for your friends or family or whomever. Um, so we're going to talk about some brain hacks, um, and there is a ton of overlap between psychology and neuroscience, obviously, um, especially in regard to what you're saying to yourself when you're exercising. So we're just going to learn a little bit about that so you can build a toolbox that creates everything that you need to develop focused techniques, self-dictated rewards, um, and self-talk. So here we go. Okay. So your opposite side lends a helping hand. Um, you'll notice at the bottom of the slide, there is a research article cited. <clears throat> I'd like you to please um, go to these articles, read the article, don't take my word for it, like geek out, learn something new, um, learn about the results, learn about the methods. All the methods are so different. They've got different participants. Um, everything just offers even like just you know, one study, thousand nuggets. So please, please look at some of these articles. Uh, many of them are available free online. So the majority of our daily movements are habitual, obviously. Um, when you, for example, are in a car, you press your accelerator with your right foot and you just don't think about it. It's automated. We do these automated movement patterns and we go throughout our days with many things automated because we've got so many things to think about. Researchers estimated that we make about 300,000 decisions a day. So with all those decisions that we're making, our brains would just explode if we had to think about all of them. That's why so many things happen by habit. So what happens if you had to use your left foot when you're driving? Can you even imagine doing that? Like put yourself in a car, close your eyes, and imagine pushing the accelerator down with your left foot and braking with your left foot. There would be a lot more automobile accidents if everybody went out yet tomorrow and tried to drive with their left foot. So I don't recommend that you do that tomorrow. But what if you treated exercise in the same way? Let's take walking up a flight of stairs. So you approach the flight of stairs, which foot steps on the first step first? probably chances are that you use the same foot every single time you take your first step. So the next time you approach a flight of stairs, think about it. Which side of your body are you using? Why do we want to think about this? Research ex examine what happens in the brain when right-handed participants use their left hand for drawing. So a little bit more challenging than just writing. This is actually drawing. They measured smoothness. They measured speed. They measured accuracy. After only 10 days of training, there were significant improvements that lasted upwards of six months. So what happens is there's <laughs> this sort of myth about like if you train yourself to be ambidextrous, then you'll be smarter and you'll be have better memory and you'll be like an elevated human. It's not really the case. 
Um, it's more the case that once you start to use the non-dominant side of your body, the functional connectivity in both sensory motor hand areas are, is improved. And it, essentially at the same time, your dominance decreases. So you'll actually see like your right hand ability or your brain uh, activity go down a little bit, but both sides work together more fluidly. Um, so in an exercise application, we want to offset unilateral injuries. Like rarely will you have somebody come in and say to you, like on a Monday morning at the water cooler, yeah, like both shoulders are really bothering me. No, they'll say my shoulder is bothering me. And maybe it's their left shoulder, maybe it's their right shoulder. Typically, this is a result of our dominant behaviors leading us to use one side more than the other, which eventually will lead to overstress and injury. So we can promote musculoskeletal balance and symmetry, maybe something you've heard, a buzzword, musculoskeletal symmetry or balance um, when you go to the chiropractor or wherever um, you happen to be reading your fitness material. Um, this will help prevent injury because you are just keeping strength equal on both sides. So if you have two sides of your body, use them both equally as much as possible. Um, so basically, let's talk about exercise adaptations. Okay, so if I'm using my left hand always to write and I write and I write and write, it gets really, really easy, right? Let's say I do bicep curls three times a week and I do 12 repetitions, uh, three sets of them, and I just do my bicep curls. And then the first week it's hard. And on the second week, it's like kind of hard. And then on the third week, it's like really not hard. What does that mean? That means you're actually burning a little bit less energy, aka calories, and your body is adapting to the exercise. Our bodies are always trying to go for efficiency because back in the caveman days, like if we were inefficient and we wasted all of our energy, then we didn't survive as a species. So we go for efficiency. We go for storage of energy, right? Versus expenditure. So that that way, when we're like being chased by woolly mammoth, then we can run away and we have the energy to do so. Nowadays, there aren't that many woolly mammoths around town, so we don't need to use the energy. So we have to find ways to prevent adaptations, to prevent efficiency, so that you can keep uh, fit and also keep your calorie burn higher. Okay, so let's just start with something simple or maybe simple. The next time you eat a meal, try picking up your fork with your non-dominant hand. So if you always eat, like I'm left-handed, so I always eat with my left hand with my fork. Um, if I tried to eat with my right hand, what would happen? I would have to slow down. I would have to think about each bite. I would have to not get food all over my clothes or my face. Um, and I might be less likely to eat the whole plate. Um, so if you're suggesting a weight loss program to somebody, or if you're just trying to practice your ambidexterity, um, try eating with the other hand. It can lower your portions, uh, can save you on some overeating. So with my clients and these uh, unilateral issues and or abilities on both sides, we see it all over the spectrum of the ways that we can um, basically enhance overall fitness using both sides of the body. So first case study, okay, client comes in and he's got unilateral shoulder and unilateral knee pain. That just means one side of the body. Uh, because dominance has been so, so heavy on one side versus the other. He even had to get his right hip replaced because that leg was so over-dominant um, and it was doing all the work and his hip was just done with him. So what we do during a training program is we do unilateral exercises for about three quarters of the exercises. So that means he has to do the left side and then the right side. And we change up which side goes first and we see the differences in strength between one side and the other. So when you're doing a workout, ask yourself how many exercises you're doing on one side versus the other. I know it takes twice as long, but you might get twice the benefit. So I also trained a client who uh, had a stroke, unfortunately, younger guy. So he, you know, lived through his stroke um, and he realized that he couldn't use one side as well as he could the other after his stroke. So we started using mental imagery to promote better balance techniques. He started to talk to his body as if he'd never had a conversation with it before in his life. So we used cues to help him balance better on both sides and so that he could walk better. He could step off a sidewalk more easily and he could feel more confident in his daily routine. 
I also had a lovely woman um, who was uh, blind. She had an autoimmune blindness, um, so, which developed over time, so she could see when she was born. And she was also about 90% deaf. She also wanted to swim. So we're gonna make that happen because I never say no to anybody. So we're gonna, when it, when it comes to uh, engaging in a fitness program, that is, okay? So we're in the pool and she has 10% of her hearing. So I'll go up to her and I cut my hands and I say, all right, you know, so-and-so, you're going to swim around the lane. And, and what we do then is we use both sides of the body by having her imagine that she has a center axis line and that she is moving equally to reach the center axis. So she was using mental imagery, using only her brain, where all of her visual and audio cues were lacking. Moreover, she was able to balance on one leg on the fitness floor and perform unilateral exercises. It was sheerly amazing. Maybe even more amazing than that. One man, gentleman came in to see me and he had his entire right arm amputated and half his uh, right leg due to exposed wires when he was a child. Okay, he ran into the wires, his, bo his body got burned and he had to remove the limbs. So he also wanted to learn how to swim. Did we say no? No, we didn't. We said, yes, okay, we can. Again, we promoted use of the other side and what was still available on both sides being as symmetrical as possible, using his mind to help him get from A to B in the pool and to do an exercise program on land. I tell you these things because nothing is impossible if you use your mind and you talk to yourself in a very kind and instructional way, which we're gonna to get to later while you're working out. Okay, so strength on one side translates to the other on a muscular level. So some big brain words here. Increased corticospinal excitability of the ipsilateral, so there's ipsilateral and contralateral in your brain, ipsilateral primary motor cortex, Interhemispheric, that means both hemispheres, right? Facilitation by a transcolossal, your uh, corpus callosum is like this, the thing in the middle of your brain that connects the two halves. Transcolossal pathways for, for cross activation. That means that both sides of your brain, when you work them equally, okay? Are part, well, when you work your muscles on both sides, both sides of your brain are communicating more effectively. So, um, this is just more neurons, which is a, a good thing. Translation, researchers used participants who had not strength trained in 12 months. This is important because they didn't have any training adaptations. So they hadn't done any strength training. They um, came in and they did right wrist exercises like this kind of deal, um, while the left wrist got low level stim. Why did they give the, uh, the participants stim? They gave them the stim in order to test the effects of having some contraction on the other side, um, because these people maybe wouldn't know if you said, uh, I want you to think about contracting your left forearm, but don't do it. They wouldn't know how to do it because they were, they were deconditioned. They hadn't strength trained in 12 months. So they put a little stim machine on one arm, and then they actually had them do the exercise on the other arm. There were significant strength increases in the left wrist area just by having no actual formal contraction, no voluntary contraction. Um, Oh, the, the left wrist only got those benefits by the right wrist doing the contraction, okay? So if you're injured, if you're in a cast on one side of your body, keep working the other side. If you have a cast on your ankle, if you're working through a knee injury, whatever, keep working the other side because both sides will benefit on a neurological level. Okay, so I alluded to this in the previous slide, but what about if we don't have a stim machine, we're just, and we don't have weights or anything, what about if we just think about a muscle? When this study first came out, it went like viral um, on, so if you Google um, just thinking about muscle causing strength or don't have to go to the gym anymore or something like that, uh, you, you might find this study pop up. Okay, so, Researchers were doing this in a clinical setting. They wanted to um, delay muscle atrophy during periods of injury or a health condition that prevented people from exercising. So they thought, well, what if we just have the patients um, do mental imagery exercises and of strong muscle contractions? Okay, so they wrapped the wrists of participants in a cast. And then with half of them, all right, they said, okay, you gotta sit here 
for 11 minutes, five days a week for four weeks. And just imagine that your muscles are exercising. And they gave them cues and they walked it through it for just 11 minutes. Just, you know, um, like the forearm is holding a weight. You are lifting the weight up things like that. How does it feel in your body? Going through the entire process of exercising without actually doing it. Okay. There are so many like studies on this effect occurring, but uh, the primary lesson from this one specifically is that just thinking about the muscle that you're engaging during exercise will compound your benefits versus doing the exercise mindlessly. So I'm not saying that you're, you don't have to go to the gym anymore because you're not going to get the cardiovascular benefit and the benefits do stop at some point. What I'm trying to uh, convey is that if you think about what you are doing while you are doing it, so if I say do a leg press, okay, you can do a leg press using your back muscles, using your foot muscles, using your calf muscles, using your whatever. If you think about the muscle that you want to have pushed that weight out while you're doing it, you will compound your benefits. I get so excited. All right. Um, I wish I could take questions this time. Do you guys have any questions? No? Okay. Well, all right. They don't have any questions yet. So we'll go back to the mental training. So there are decades worth and hundreds of studies supporting the gains from mental practice in both physical and cognitive tasks. Okay. Um, so mental training can help reduce anxiety, um, like pretest anxiety. In one study, um, these uh, surgical students had hand tremors because they were nervous about, you know, holding the scalpel. So they did these mental imagery exercises and their hand tremors went away. Um, you know, I mean, think about it. How does that happen? How can your brain tell your muscle to stop doing an involuntary contraction? It's just simply amazing. And we just don't stop to think about it. So the sheer like gratitude for having the mental control over your body and the way that we just sort of like take it for granted and don't use it to its fullest capacity is incredible. So that's why we're here. Okay. So mental training can reduce anxiety. Uh, it can decrease or increase the sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic nervous system is the one that um, like is active when we're active. Parasympathetic is like our down one when we're like doing meditation or sleeping or yoga, our sympathetic is more of our upper one. Um, and it can enhance contralateral strength, which means contra, so both sides crossing over contralateral strength, um, as we saw from the previous slide. So um, another study that was kind of fun that I, I looked up was uh, using football players. And um, this is a, a conditioned group, right? These are athletes we're talking about, okay? So the mental training group um, and the physical training group in the comparison with the group who did nothing, who just had a baseline, they were like strong guys, right? Um, so those who were then assigned to do mental imagery versus those who were assigned to go to the gym and lift versus those who were assigned to do nothing, don't lift, just rest on your laurels. They had the same almost to an exact amount statistically significant strength gain over a two week period. That is absolutely ridiculously awesome. So if you're fit and you're worried about getting deconditioned or whatever, if you're like taking a couple of weeks off or you're traveling, just sit and daydream about your workouts. Think about your muscles. Check in with your posture when you're standing up and walking around. That literally is enough to promote strength gains when you are taking a break from exercise, okay? So this study didn't go for the long-term. They didn't see the long-term deconditioning um, of these athletes during mental versus physical. So we're talking about a short period of time here, like a couple of weeks. Okay. So shifting gears just a little bit, um, wanted to talk about uh, the power of mirrors and mirror neurons. So um, it's one thing to just look at somebody else demonstrating a movement. Like if I say, okay, this is how you do this exercise. You, you go to a YouTube video and it's like, look, you lift your leg up and down or whatever. Um, that's, you know, a good for an instruction to execute it properly. But is motor imagery enough to elicit autonomic nervous system responses? Uh, that means um, things that happen naturally, like if you're scared, um, uh, someone like jumps out at you and you're scared, your heart rate goes up and you might get a little like uh, sweaty or flushed or something like that. That's an autonomic nervous system response. So we get the same thing when we start to exercise, our heart rate goes up, we start to sweat, uh, we get some nerve activity in the muscles. 
does just like looking at somebody exercising do the same thing? The answer is kind of, yeah, in some cases it does, which is just incredibly mind blowing. Um, when witnessing another person exercising or movie or moving, our body reacts in preparation to move. It's getting ready because we've got these things called mirror neurons. So like if we see somebody who's feeling sad, we feel sad. If we see somebody who's laughing, we might be more inclined to laugh. Um, we have the same physiological reaction when we see somebody move. Our body starts preparing us for that movement. If we sort of like take in what they're doing mentally as they're moving. Okay. So what about watching yourself in the mirror? Turns out that when you watch yourself in the mirror, it compounds the effect of mental focus on the muscle groups because it helps provide you another cue, right? You not only have your mental cue of what you're doing, like if I had my eyes closed, I could still imagine my bicep or I could still imagine my neck tensing up. But what if I could see it in a mirror? That would actually compound the benefit of the exercise uh, in addition to providing you objective feedback on whether or not your form is correct, okay? So we're, what we're talking about is that you're creating maximal benefits by um, layering on how many cues you have. So you would go to the gym, watch somebody do an exercise, then you get your weights and think about doing the exercise and think about what muscle you want to use. And then you would look at yourself doing it. Okay. And then there's one more step that we've got to layer on here. But before we do that, <laughs> um, let's talk about watching somebody versus imagining do it yourself. Which one is a stronger effect, okay? Which one does the brain, the neurons react more to? So visual imagery or VI, watching somebody else, activates a different neural pathway than kinetic Im imagery, which is like you're the one doing it. So if I imagine myself doing it versus watching somebody else do it, turns out Imagining yourself doing it, putting yourself in your own shoes um, before you do the exercise yields more activity in motor associated structures. So you are like queuing up your body or internalizing that imagery more effectively than watching somebody else do it. Okay. This is um, a partially because it requires you to feel the movement, what you're doing and imagine it. Um, but you can use visual imagery, like if somebody's never done an exercise before, they don't know what it's supposed to feel like. The visual imagery is a good way um, to kind of work around that if you haven't done something before and you need to learn it. Um, so even, so this study um, used patients who had experienced a stroke and it looked at specifically the mirror neuron system. Um, this, so then they showed them people walking and they put electrodes on their brain and saw what happened. So when patients who had had a stroke, which is a brain injury, watched people that do, do, perform degate observation, there were activations in what's called Broca's area, okay? Um, so that area of the brain was active. Broca's area is our speech area. So this is just so wild because stroke patients, you know, they like can't talk afterwards sometimes and they have speech impairments almost, you know, that can be long lasting. When they were looking at somebody walking, the Broca's area lit up. The stroke patients were talking to themselves about walking after they experienced somebody else doing it via visual imagery. Okay. Can you see why this is so exciting? Okay. So we're going to keep going. We're going to keep geeking out. All right. So let's keep talking to ourselves like I kind of am doing right now, but I'm talking to all of you and these two guys, my friends here. Okay. So meta-analyses are super valuable if you want to look at results from a ton of studies. So a meta-analyses um, looked at the results of 32 studies and found um, a lot, out a lot about self-talk. Now self-talk has been like research has been going on since the seventies and like, you can do it, man, or like, this is how you do it or good. Yes. Or like, no, that stunk or whatever. So the results of 32 studies categorize the type of self-talk that people were engaging in. Okay. Instructional self-talk is uh, more effective for and then motivational self-talk so says this study there are conflicting you know results or like people who would argue um a different way but for, uh, for these studies instructional self-talk is is very effective um and it's effective for fine tasks versus gross tasks okay so if i'm just running i'm not just going to say like run run more run more and more 
Um, I'm like, let's say I am uh, like trying to focus on hitting a ball, uh, kicking a ball into a net. I'll say, look at the ball or foot strike or something about an instruction about how to get that fine task performed versus the gross task of like, go win the game. Okay, you get the point. And uh, instructional self-talk is also better for novel tasks versus learned tasks because if you have learned it already, then you kind of don't need to instruct yourself as much on it in sports specific, particularly with these studies anyway. But for novel tasks, instructional self-talk was incredibly helpful. Pretty intuitive knowledge, right, to know this. Okay, so another fascinating result of this meta-analysis was that adherence to exercise habits are significantly higher for those who talk themselves into it versus those who rely on external forces or cues. So this is psychological concept. So psychology is kind of creeping into this presentation, whether we like it or not, because we are talking about the brain. Um, this is called intrinsic motivation. So you might have heard this term in your intro to psych class way back in the day, but intrinsic motivation is something, a motivation that comes from within us versus uh, from an external source. So like, for example, if I'm going to go get on the treadmill, I would be extrinsically motivated if I knew that there was a TV on the treadmill and that it was telling me that I had to do one mile. Okay. So I would be intrinsically motivated to get on the treadmill if I knew that I would feel really good afterwards and that it would shake off all my stress from the day. Or if I knew that I was myself going to do it five days that week and that I needed to do it. That's intrinsic motivation. So I'm talking myself into it versus saying, oh, the TV's there. I can just do that. So the habit of exercise and this is an important one for yourself and for you know everybody we might be talking to about adopting habits. The habit, because habits can be kind of good or bad, right? So the habit of exercise is different than non-conscious habits. We've got tons of non-conscious habits, things that we just do. Um, because it is a practiced reinforcement of self-directed instructions, which eventually becomes easier and easier more um, over time, more automatic. And hence more enjoyable, right? When something's easy, you, you tend to like it more um, for most things, right? You, you know, you do it and it's hard and you don't really like it, but then you start doing it more and more and it becomes more automatic. And then you can kind of talk to yourself in a positive way, say, okay, I didn't hate that quite as much this time. Maybe I'll do it again. So the brain has has elements that we're going to go over in the end uh, of the summary here but just to recap briefly you can talk yourself into using your non-dominant side you can elicit an exercise reaction simply by watching somebody else doing it um you can you know uh engage in positive self-talk um you can do all these things in order to just make your exercise program that much more effective So when it comes to talking to yourself, you can't be nice, don't say anything at all, okay? So for athletes who aren't learning a task, but they're just trying to get through something like a really hard run or a really long uh, game or something like that, um, they're not just trying to get through it, but so they're, try they're trying to just get through the activity. Positive motivational versus instructional self-talk increases flow experiences. So flow is kind of a buzzy word these days, right? This flow experience, flow state um, that we can get into. But there, what that basically means, if you've ever experienced flow, it's where like you run five miles and you feel like you haven't done anything or like the hour goes by so quickly and you were exercising, but you didn't even realize what you were doing. That's a flow state. You can get flow states in doing things like writing um, where it just like sort of happens. It flows out of you. Um, so these are flow experiences in this population was cross country runners. Negative self-talk on the other hand, um, is, was a self-fulfilling prophecy essentially for swimmers um, whose performance decreased when they brought attention to their errors. So that's me saying, oh God, that flip turn sucked. Or like, oh, that was 10 seconds slower than the last one. And 
as you know, as it turns out, um, if you if you can't avoid the negative self talk, and there's a reason why people engage in negative self talk, but it actually is like uh, deleterious on on a very linear level of her performance. Um, using no emotion is your best bet. So just keep using instructional self talk. So you don't have to say like, "Way to go, man! You're awesome." You can just keep instructing yourself using like little cues um, that to you know just keep going in your positive performance. And this works for both athletes and novice exercisers. So both motivational and instructional self-talk help fifth and sixth graders perform better on a basketball skill task. So they did chest pass practice um, and they use like a, yeah, good job, or you can do this. Um, and they also use like focus cues, like elbows extend or look at the other person's chest. Um, but Turns out only motivational self-talk when they had to do push-ups. So when they were thinking about like belly button in tight or keep your feet planted or whatever it was, didn't really help them get through the push-up set. They had to tell themselves just three more, you've got this. And that's what made them get through it. Um, so let's just take a brief example for um, like a client session. Cause you know, I, uh, it's so fun. Every, every session that I have with, that's why I'll never stop training because every single session is like a new human experiment um, and into what people can actually do if they use their minds. So I will tell a client um, during, let's say they're doing a plank and all they can think is, Oh my gosh, 45 seconds this is the longest 45 seconds of my life. I can't wait for this to be over. So instead, we use cues and they're single word cues and they're a rotating area of focus. So they're in their plank and I'll say chin, chest, belly button, butt, abs, kneecaps, ankles, belly button, shoulder blades, neck, and then 45 seconds is over. And they're like, oh, wow, I just did that. That was kind of easy. Using these self-talk cues, or with me, I was telling them what cue it was, but, you know, they hopefully were then, you know, ingraining the cue in as they were doing the exercise. It helps get through something when you need to get to the finish line. So you can't say, good job, man, you can get through this, then instruct yourself. Whatever you do, avoid negativity at all costs. Okay. So even in the 70s, applied sports psychology research revealed that the damage of negative self-talk is like ubiquitous in performance. Rarely do you see a person say, yeah, I was just like down on myself the entire time and I still won. Or at least maybe they're not saying it, but um, when it's actually measured, um, it turns out that there's a linear relationship between negative self-talk and points lost um, during a tennis match. So since then, it's been applied to non-sports and to pseudo-sports tasks. Um, so, okay, so darts players, right? In 1995, before like any EEGs or fMRIs were available for use, um, they uh, like lost more games and they performed worse when they engaged in negative self-talk um, or negative gestures like, ah, or something like that, because all these are measured on the, in the study. They thought that um, criticism in the form of negative self-talk would help make them get better, right? If you don't say what's wrong, then how can you get any better? That mindset actually isn't a great rationale um, as far as exercise is concerned. So when you're going through and like editing a paper, like if you see a comma is missing, you can't just say good job and it'll make it better. But when it comes to exercise, revert back to instructional and motivational self-talk versus negative at all costs, okay? So positive self-talk, yes, was correlated with more points won in young tennis players. Negative self-talk was correlated with more points lost. And this was like a line item thing, like very, very specific. Um, so application, those who are just starting on an exercise program, um, they, you know, kind of feel badly about it at first. Like, oh man, I can't believe I went this long without it. This is going to be so hard. Like another hour, you know, you've heard these things before, but Sticking with it is actually correlated with a decreased negative affect. So like the next day they do it the second time and they're like, all right, well, that wasn't that bad. And then maybe the fifth time they say, okay, I, I, I kind of enjoyed that actually for like a minute or, or I felt really good afterwards. So decreased negative affect, you know, kind of comes on both sides of it. Right. So then hopefully they can avoid negativity while they're doing the exercise um, so that they are positive about it all the time. So this has like public health ramifications, obviously, um, because a lot of people don't get the exercise they really need. 
Okay, so that was like a ton of information. Um, and I just want to um, go through a little bit of a grand summary here. Okay, so we've done a lot of looking at research. Uh, there are so many studies, it's so much fun to like peel back the layers. But basically, if you're going to talk about it to somebody, um, the way it works is the brain serves as a time wedge, including thoughts, feelings, commands, instructions between physical stress, um, the exercise actually causing and the mental emotional reaction because our like visceral reaction, that's not what's, what's not in the frontal cortex is saying, this is stressful, this is harmful, this is bad, stop. So what, what our brain does is it recruits higher order functions in the frontal cortex to tell us literally on a neurological level that it's okay, this is how you do it, keep going. So the areas of the brain associated with language and emotions are activated during both vocal and non-vocal self-talk. Okay, so these, um, you know, kind of override those dominant negative feedback ones that are more back here in the limbic system that tell us like, don't do this, you're going to die if you do this. Um, so in a 24 year, this is just published this year, this 24 year follow up meta analytic a replication and extension study. It's just published like this month in February when I'm um, the last day of February, I'm recording this uh, presentation for your viewing. Um, that basically there are so many durable research applications of mental practice on performance. The key moderators here, moderators just mean like things that are going to change the effect size um, and the correlation. The moderators to this beneficial effect include duration and type of task. So we talked a lot about, you know, how long um, does the benefit last? Um, what sport specific is it? What type of activity are you using? You know, are the, are the people fit or unfit? Um, so these are just uh, things to keep in mind when you're using mental cues and using your mind for exercise. Um, so mental practice has a stronger effect for externally cued movement um, compared for internally cued. So meaning like if you look at it, then you're more likely to have an effect than if it's all coming from just your brain. So having some visual imagery um, is, is quite useful uh, for mental practice or like actually engaging in it while you're thinking of it helps versus just like sitting and thinking of it without any other cue. So mental practice also has a stronger effect for programs between one and six weeks. Um, I'm not sure if that's just because the studies didn't really go for longevity um, or if the, the effect dropped off. Um, I'm not sure wh what the rationale is behind um, that result, um, but I just wanted to include it. So it's like a direction for future research. Okay. So, Let's just take a moment and digest all of that awesomeness. Then the next time you're gonna do a workout, try doing everything on your non-dominant side first when you're doing unilateral exercises. Or if you're leaving your house to your office and you're taking the stairs, use the other leg or notice which leg you tend to use and use the other one the next time you go down the flight or up the flight. Uh, think about the muscle you're trying to activate while you do the exercise. If you're doing a bicep curl, don't think about what you're having for dinner. Think about your bicep. Think about your shoulder blades. Think about your breathing, okay? Um, watch somebody else doing exercises on YouTube videos and just like then imagine yourself doing the same thing. Uh, look in the mirror in an objective way. Don't look at it and think, man, I really need to lose those last 10 pounds on my tummy. No, look at it specific to the exercise that you're performing for form, okay? Stare at your muscle being used. This will actually help put you in a meditative flow state during your exercise program. Instruct yourself on new and challenging tasks using single words or simple cues. This can be a rotating area of focus, and we'll do like a little example here at the end um, to show you kind of what that means in practice. Um, and kind of tell yourself that you can do it when you're nearing the end of a hard cardio burst. Like if you see I have two minutes left to go, be like, yes, you just did 58 minutes and you are rocking this out and you have two minutes left in this particular exercise. How good can you make it? Sometimes when I'm working out or when I'm with a client, I'll say, you have two more opportunities. 
how different does that sound than saying you have two more? That just means like oh, two more. No, you have two more opportunities. Try it the next time you're in the gym. Also, so rotating the point of focus, like when you're holding a plank, we're gonna kind of like do this little example in a second. Um, but uh, then after you finish your workout, when you eat, do one of the things with the other hand, okay? Try holding the fork in the other hand for like four bites, unless you're like starving and then like, you know, after the first four bites, switch hands and try the other one. Okay, so just uh, to talk a little bit about um, me again, just for a second, uh, I'm doing this marathon training program and it's the first time I've actually trained for a marathon. Um, now, uh, like, teaser alert. Um, I did a marathon before and I had dislocated my pelvis on a bike accident before the marathon and I couldn't run. And I, t I said to myself and to other people, I said, if I finish this marathon, I didn't tell anybody I was doing it either because everyone said, don't do that. Like that's stupid. But I said, if I finish it, then I'm going to write a book called how to run a marathon without running. Um, I did finish the marathon. Uh, in fact, I was pacing for 310 um, finish until mile 20. And that 20 mile wall is a very real thing, especially if you haven't trained and I hit it. So I finished my marathon in 319. Um, so I'm going to do another one in a month. So I'm like living, breathing, running. I feel like I'm going a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs more than I generally am. Um, but we'll see what actually training for a marathon does. Do, like I'll be proof in the pudding. I don't know. How much did my mental cues and not running help my running versus actually putting in the miles with 60 miles a week slog. So we'll see how it goes. But the point is that I've been running a lot. And when I'm running, I talk to myself. I only have me. Like I run with a group a little bit, but I really only have me. So what do I do? Okay. Pre-run, I take note of my body. I do a full body head to toe tech check like a doctor does when you go into the doctor's office. Then I go for a walk. And I think about where my body is right now. What's locking up? Where do I feel like my range of motion has to stop when I'm walking before I do my run? As I'm doing my run, I give myself instructions via, um, by virtue of like simple single word or, or, or light cues. Okay, foot plant, I go there. Cadence, how fast is my foot turnover? How, how do my hamstrings feel? Are my abs on? Is my mouth closed? Is my mouth open? If it's closed, open it. If it's open, close it. Um, light step, I think like pitter patter. Well, that's later too. Um, turn trunk, pump elbows, shake arms, find your butt. Like these are the things that I say to myself when I'm running. So it's not just like slowly degrading in form as I go through these, you know, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 mile runs. Motivational self-talk when running. Keep it steady. I'll tell myself, let's go. I'll tell myself. Sometimes I'll start to sing and dance um, to the music. Like I'll pretend like I'm in my own music video, okay, which looks really awesome to people around me. Uh, one more time is like one more mile or one more loop. One more time, one more opportunity. Often I'll tell myself on a fast bit, don't fear the speed. And then the last one is pitter patter. That helps me keep from feeling like I'm slogging through the ground to get to my finish point. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about real quick is running when it hurts, okay? If I feel something tweak, I'll say, whoa, like out loud, like, whoa, buddy, or careful, or it's okay, it's okay. Because when something hurts, your body sends all of these signals to say like, stop, stop, pain, like you're gonna break in half. So I'll say, whoa, calm down. How bad is it? Can I keep going? Okay, it'll pass. Use something else. If my right ankle hurts, think about my left hip instead. It works a lot of the time, actually. Um, and then I'll call my muscles buddy. Like, hey, buddy, like, it's okay. I know it sounds crazy, so I'm like outing myself right now, but it really does work. Okay, so I am um, gonna uh, stop sharing the screen. Um, for a moment. Cool. 
And um, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for engaging in this conversation with me. Um, I hope you had as much fun as I did. Um, and then I want to share the screen one more time because I want you to please um, go out and tell everybody you know about something about what you learned today. Um, so um, that could be in the form of a very scientific tweet. Uh, mental training enhances cortical output, driving muscles to higher activation level and increasing strength. Positive instructional self-talk activates the frontal cortex to allow more controlled and sustained performance. Or you can do the easy tweet, okay? Um, simply thinking about your muscles makes them stronger. Watching someone else exercise activates your energy systems and affirmations during a workout will keep you going longer. Pretty cool, right? All right. I'm going to stop the share. We are done with our handy dandy geek out slideshow, um, which I hope you'll have available to you after the summit is complete. Um, I want to thank my friends behind me. Um, and I want to thank you all for engaging with me. Um, please contact me if you have any questions. Um, you know, I do like e-workshops and like e-workouts and I do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and, um, yeah, life is good. Life is fun. Use your brain to control your body and enjoy. Thanks so much.